Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so the title of the talk is Threats, Facts, Bribes, and Beyond. All we do to stop a click. Uh, the talk is basically going to be about security awareness and training, uh, by which I mean different government and private sector programs uh, that different companies and uh, government agencies employ in order to teach their employees and citizenry in general about online security risks. Um, I want to focus on kind of some of the major challenges uh, the, that are faced by people in the field, the different approaches people take to security awareness, um, kind of uh, talk about the big uh, vendors and um, agents in the field, and also what are really the focus is going to be, what are the, some, of, some of the most common pitfalls uh, or uh, some of the most common mistakes that people make when they're implementing security awareness programs. So we'll start with the um, RSA hack. In uh, 2011, RSA got breached. Uh, I think pretty much everyone's heard about it. And uh, basically, an RSA employee received an email um, in the spam mailbox. They went to the mailbox, uh, opened the email, found that it had an attachment. They downloaded the attachment. It turned out to be malicious, uh, malicious to the extent that not only did it infect the employee's own personal machine, but also uh, infected a significant portion of RSA's network. And RSA was forced to recall uh, a lot of their security tokens, uh, which are used by both uh, public, center, uh, public sector employees and private sector employees for authentication purposes. Now, this was a very big breach. It cost RSA um, you know, in tens of millions of dollars. Just the initial cost of the breach uh, was estimated uh, to be $63 million. Right, so one employee's mistake led to $63 million in losses. Right, that's, that's a big number. And really, the employee had very little reason to open that email. Right? Um, how many of you actually go to your spam folder and check it? Right. Do you, how often do you actually find something in there that is worth responding? Once in a while. And that's kind of the problem. Uh, for most people, they have no reason to kind of check the spam folder a majority of the time. Uh, it should not be something that should, should be responding to. Um, so this error has uh, been uh, categorized as uh, the biggest problem in security, which is the problem of the human control. And the human control is considered to be the weakest link in the security chain. Uh, it has been uh, epitomized in a very pithy saying from uh, uh, Ed Felton and uh, Gary McGraw that given the choice between security and dancing pigs, uh, people will choose dancing pigs all the time, which is to say that humans just can't help themselves, right? We make bad decisions. Uh, we smoke cigarettes, uh, we drive, uh, we text while driving, and we enroll into PhD programs. Uh, <laughs> So we make bad decisions. And this is kind of a common consensus, um, not just uh, in academia. There's, there's been several papers written on the problem of the weakest link. Um, pretty much every year, I review a paper that starts with, as we all know, humans are the weakest link in security. I've actually written a paper myself that starts with that same sentence. Um, but it's also something that is very commonly assumed in the industry. So there's, it's kind of a very a uh, common theme underlying both research as practitioners. Um, and I'm going to question uh, that statement, but that's going to be a little bit later in the talk. Uh, let's talk about the other side of the equation. So let's start with the assumption that you know, human errors are a problem, which they are. right? Um, it would be uh, disingenuous to say that uh, human errors are not a problem. Uh, well, then how do we? kind of manage the risk from human errors. And that's where the security awareness and training market comes in. So there are countless vendors on the market right now providing security awareness and training materials. Um, and it's a very big market. Uh, and even though most uh, executives are not that excited about training and awareness, um, actually security awareness vendors tend to do quite well. Uh, Gartner, which is a third-party assessor that assesses the maturity of security programs, says that these vendors uh, accrue up to uh, more than a billion dollars in just revenue every year. 
and it's by no means a stagnant market. So uh, a Poneman uh, survey, um, a recent Poneman survey, actually um, noted that 55% of companies don't have any security awareness program at all. 25% of those companies were planning to have a security awareness program within the next year or so. And they're not planning to do it half-heartedly. They're actually planning to spend, um, well, 27% of them are planning to spend about um, half a million to a million dollars. 21%, are, uh, sorry, 14% are planning to spend more than a million dollars, right? So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot more money to be made in that market. So, well, you can say, well, what about kind of uh, the, you know, the Bradley or Wilder effect in polling, right? So um, if I walk to an executive and I said, well, what do you think about security awareness? Should you have it in your company? Of course, they're going to say yes, right? Well, it turns out a lot of companies may not have a choice anymore in whether they are going to have a security awareness program or not because uh, industry standards like PCI, DSS, which is the payment card industry uh, data security standard, and GLBA, which is the Graham leach bliley Act, have uh, requirements about training and awareness and security controls. So, and actually, Poneman's survey noted that the majority of players who do have a security awareness program, they have it because of PCI DSS. So that's the good story, right? To train or not to train is no longer the question uh, because uh, increasingly regulations and industry standards are going to compulsorily require that you have some kind of a program in place. The thing is, what policy cannot change is people's attitudes towards security awareness and training, right? And the attitude very much is that training does not work. And uh, Bruce Schneier, um, I you know, very pithily put it, that training is a waste of time. And this is, this is not just his opinion. This is, again, a very common opinion. Bruce Schneier is actually very uniquely placed that you know, he, he's kind of an academic, kind of an industry person. He's, uh, he's a practitioner, but he's also a researcher. So his, uh, his statement is actually uh, reflects the opinion of a lot of people in the industry and in, uh, the, even in the research community. Um, especially this opinion is shared by a lot of C-level executives who make the decision of how much budget is going to be spent on uh, you know, different controls, and in particular, the security awareness control. And because people are pessimistic about security awareness and training, uh, they don't do much about it. The goal there is to kind of provide lip service to the compliance uh, checkbox, uh, but that's really all it does. And that's reflected in the results. So 50% of security awareness program, uh, by the way, this is, this is uh, based on uh, a SANS report which came out in the, within the last month. 50% of security awareness programs uh, have a budget of $5,000 or less. Um, or they don't know what their budget is, which translated means that their budget is $0. And it is surprising, but I meet a lot of colleagues who do what I do, and they don't have any money to spend on security awareness. Now, imagine if we applied that same logic to a completely different control, right? If I paid someone uh, $5,000 to um, run a firewall, or if I paid someone $5,000 to you know, uh, deploy an enterprise-wide um, um, network uh, protection system, right? It's just not going to be very successful because that's very little money. In addition, people who do security awareness, less than 15% of them do it on a full-time basis. And in fact, for 64% of them, uh, they spend a less than a quarter of their time uh, doing security awareness and training. So this is basically what is happening. It's not like uh, you know company X decided that they want to do security awareness and training, and so they hired someone with the right background, with the right skills, gave them some budget to run a program. What is happening is that I've decided you know, I'm a, an executive, I have 15 people in, in, my, um, in my conference room, and I think, well, you know, Dave has a lot of time on his hands, right? And he hasn't been doing that much lately anyways. So how about we ask him to print out some flyers and he can distribute them around the office, right? Or he can send out a few emails about phishing. And this is kind of reflected in the background of security awareness professionals. 80% um, of them uh, actually have a technical background. They come from IT. 
they do things like uh, network debugging, they do security architecture, uh, they do server administration. Um, what do all of these three things have in common? Uh, they have no experience with humans. Uh, right. Uh, let me say, let me put it differently, right? They have no experience with non-experts. They mostly talk to other technical people, and so a lot of things, um, a lot of things are already given to them, right? Um, I would say that most people in this room, uh, when they receive an email from a Nigerian prince claiming that he has a billion dollars that he wants to siphon and just wants your twenty thousand dollars to siphon it, you would be slightly suspicious because uh, you don't know that many Nigerian princes. Presumably, uh, I don't. are also, in some ways, very vested in making sure people don't click on something they shouldn't because then they're the ones that often have to help clean up the mess. So is that? Right. And their typical solution would be, well, we need to um, put some other kind of technical control in place so people don't click on things, right? So either they would have very restrictive policies on the uh, email servers, right? So. Uh, what would end up happening is that a lot of legitimate email will actually going, end up going to people's spam folders. Uh, so people will be forced to check their spam folders and find a lot of legitimate stuff. And so they won't be able to differentiate between legitimate emails and not well, suspicious emails. They do have a lot of stake in it, but what they don't have is background in how to communicate to non-experts. And this kind of becomes a little bit of a market of lemons, um, I think pretty much uh, most people know what market of lemons is, but um, it's a term from Akerlof that basically says that if a buyer cannot distinguish a good product from a bad product in the market, uh, the only thing they can differentiate us, uh, on is the price. So as a seller, you're not incentivized to sell a quality product, you're just incentivized to sell the cheapest product, right? So the market will keep selling cheaper and baser products till the point that every seller in the market is basically selling junk. And this is basically what happens. Um, people start with the assumption that security awareness does not work, so they decide let's not waste any money on it. Uh, well, someone from the compliance team comes and says, well, you, we have regulatory requirements that we need to have some kind of awareness and training. Uh, they find someone random in the department whom they, uh, you know, who hasn't been doing enough work, and they give uh, them the task to do security awareness. And of course, you know, that doesn't work. Someone does something, and then it turns around and they say, see, I told you, security awareness does not work. So it's a bit of a market of lemons, and it's a market of lemons be uh, because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Security awareness does not work because people believe it does not work, right? So what are some of the lemons in this market, right? And so that, that's kind of what I'm going to talk about, threats, facts, and bribes. So let's start with the number one lemon, threats. So in 2009, Cormac Hurley wrote a paper, So Long and thanks for, No Thanks for All the Externalities, where he basically argued that people are completely rational in ignoring security uh, advice and ad ignoring advice from security experts. And the argument there was that for the most, uh, for the most part, if you're a consumer, you do not suffer any direct costs from making bad security decisions, right? So if I, as a consumer, go to a website and I, uh, well, you know, some random untrustworthy website, and I give them my credit card information, and the website turns around and makes a bunch of fraudulent charges uh, on that card, I am not the one who's on the hook for that money, right? It's going to be the issuer or the bank who's going to have to pay that money, right? So he makes the argument that, you know, since there's no cost, to making bad security decisions, people don't care about security. And this is not just an academic argument. Uh, Paul Beckman, who is the Paul Beckman, who is the chief information security officer of uh, the Department of Homeland Security, said that employees do not demonstrate secure behaviors uh, because there's no cost to non-compliance. Right. So people click on anything they see, they go to any website they can go to because what's going to happen? Right. They're not going to get laid off. Then nothing's going to happen to them. And so he uh, made the proposal that we need to do something about it, right? Um, so the old adage, 
spare the rod, spoil the child. So people have said that you know, employees should be terminated if they demonstrate a lot of uh, bad security behaviors, um, or uh, they should have their network access revoked. They should be reprimanded there by, by their manager, um, have their pay docked, um, and have their security clearances revoked. Right. This is something that Paul Beckman has uh, said publicly. He believes that if employees uh, do three, uh, if employees demonstrate three security violations, then their security clearances should be taken away. Right. Um, and the, the particular security violation he's talking about is uh, clicking on phishing emails. Uh, so if employees click on three uh, simulated phishing emails um, um, consecutively, uh, their security clearance should be taken away. Here's the catch, though. A lot of internal organizational emails actually look like phishing emails. And the larger the size of the organization, the more likely um, are they going to have that problem. Partly is because there's not a lot of branding awareness in most organizations. So um, if company X uses a certain kind of type font, uh, they use a certain kind of logo, or they use certain colors, uh, it's not that every other person who sends out email in that organization is actually going to follow that rule. Uh, this problem becomes more aggravated because a lot of time companies hire external vendors. So it's not like their emails, um, the origin of the email is at company.com, right? It might be at uh, cif.com, right? Uh, so the emails are not formatted correctly. Uh, they originate externally, so they don't have a company domain name. Uh, so really, what else is left in order for someone to look at an email and be able to judge whether it's legitimate or not? Um, it's actually quite hard to tell whether an employee clicked on an email or not. So um, just to give you a background of like these simulated phishing exercises, you hire a vendor. Uh, the vendor sends out fake phishing emails on your behalf to uh, employees in your company. And then uh, the vendor tracks whether the employee clicked on the embedded link in the email or not. right? The problem is actually quite hard to tell whether they clicked or not. Uh, because what happens is that sometimes uh, when your email is coming uh, in through the company gateway, there might be some kind of processing done on that email. Uh, they might run the uh, URL of that email through some kind of a check. And that might register as a click event on the vendor side. And there's a host of other issues. Uh, the email gateway, uh, gateway might be set up in a way that it's hard for you to distinguish uh, who's been clicking on things. Um, employees actually get really irritated when they are told that they clicked on something uh, because they turn around and say, well, I was never told that you know, I had to look out for this. And a lot of employees get uh, very, very pissed off because they think that you're trying to trick them. But you kind of are, uh, but so are the cyber criminals, right? But uh, set this aside. Uh, depending upon, it's not like you have a specific class of employees who click on phishing emails. Turns out everyone clicks on phishing emails, right? Uh, a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend who was working at a very friendly company. Uh, was told that only dumb people click on phishing emails uh, by his very, very senior executive. Uh, so they decided, and he decided to counter that. He said, no, actually, anyone can click on phishing emails, including you. And uh, so they had a competition. And the idea was that if he can get that executive to click on a phishing email within a certain amount of time span, that executive would be asked to leave the company. Now, imagine if you're that executive and you receive an email, not that any of this happened. Uh, imagine if you are an executive uh, working at that company and you receive an email saying, hey, Dave, uh, remember we had that bet? You clicked on a phishing email. Click here uh, to receive a severance package. Um, so everyone clicks, right? It's just a question of how well tailored that email is. Uh, 
So maybe uh, using threats is not the greatest idea, right? And threats are basically just about increasing the cost of noncompliance with security policies. And we don't have to necessarily reinvent the wheel, right? We've seen this in other risk domains as well. And one of the uh, risk domains is uh, driving under influence. So the first uh, uh, drunk driving law was passed in Indiana in somewhere, sometime in the mid-30s, right? And there was a certain penalty, and there was a certain um, blood alcohol level that was associated with it. And over decades, uh, the penalties for driving under influence kept on, getting, kept on increasing, while the alcohol tolerance level kept on decreasing. But there was very little, despite the increasing penalty, there was very little reduction in the number of people who were driving under influence. But the thing that really worked well was the campaign that said, friends don't let friends drive drunk. And in fact, since that campaign has come out, uh, there's been a steady decline in uh, the number of people driving under influence. Now, it's reasonable to have a debate about whether that campaign is the only thing that you know, led to the decline in driving under influence. But the idea being that increasing penalties had very little impact on changing people's behaviors. Actually, there's a paper that came out today morning that uh, said that instead of increasing the amount of uh, penalty, you should increase the probability of being penalized. And that, that is much better uh, changing people's behavior. But again, the, the idea that threats can easily change behaviors uh, is not necessarily true. And uh, I really like this quotation. Civilization is nothing more than an effort to reduce the use of force to the last resort, right? So we should definitely use threats, right? There, there'll be some, there'll always be some employees in your organization uh, who, um, in spite of any amount of training, will demonstrate bad security behaviors. And certainly, they need to face some kind of penalties. But that really should be the last resort. The first resort should be civilization, right? So how do we create a civilization? Through education. So um, the second lemon is facts. And the idea there is uh, that we have to provide, if we could only educate people and tell them uh, what are the consequences of poor security behaviors, that they will be more secure in the future. And this is, uh, this is also, this is a wisdom that is also shared by the government. So you have the Stop, Think, Connect initiative, uh, which is uh, a joint venture between the Anti-Phishing Working Group and the National Cybersecurity Alliance. And its government leadership is provided by no other than the Department of Homeland Security. And their goal is to educate uh, citizenry in general to protect themselves against cyber criminals. And it's a very uh, noble goal. Problem number one with that goal. Uh, if you want to educate people, you have to know the facts that you want to educate people on, right? So in the, in the medical uh, sort of risk domain, uh, we know that people should wash hands, right? And pretty much everyone will agree that washing hands is good uh, if you don't want to fall sick. In security, the advice is a lot more complicated. Uh, this uh, cartoon kind of talks about how over decades we have trained people to build passwords that are very difficult for humans to remember, but very easy for computers to guess, when really the goal is completely opposite. What we want is to create passwords that are easy for humans to remember, but difficult uh, for computers to guess. Uh, there is, uh, if you think that that was an easy problem to solve, there's a little bit more contentious problem. Should you have mandatory password expiration policies, right? Uh, Laurie Craner, who's the chief technologist at FTC, recently said that maybe having mandatory password changes is not a great idea. And um, her argument is backed by data. So uh, studies from University of North Carolina and Carleton University have shown that uh, changing passwords actually has little impact on password guessing attacks. And then Angela Sass from um, University College London has, um, has argued that in fact, having mandatory password policies uh, creates more, uh, actually reduces security because if you have to change your password, then you're more likely to choose a weaker password 
because you have to constantly remember a new piece of information. So let's set this aside for a second. Let's just assume that somehow magically, as a, as a community, all security professionals can come to a common body of knowledge that we think we should communicate to end users, right? which we can, but let's assume that we can. Well, the way training is delivered actually violates a lot of very basic learning science principles. So currently, uh, most companies and most government organizations uh, deliver training through e-learning modules. It turns out that the average retention rate, did you guys have to take any of this kind of training? Okay, never mind. Uh, turns out the average retention rate on an e-learning module is 26% right after you've taken the module, and 6%, uh, 4%, six weeks after you've taken the module. So it certainly doesn't seem very useful. Um, most of these modules uh, focus at one topic at a time. So irrespective of the vendor you choose, uh, there'll be one e-learning module on phishing, uh, one on encryption, one on data classification. On the other hand, um, learning sciences actually tell us that it's much better to interleave topics. There's not a lot of repetition, right? Most training is uh, kind of an annual training requirement. So PCI DSS, for example, has an annual training requirement. So once a year, you sit in a room, uh, you switch on your computer, you take the e-learning module. Uh, there's not a lot of repetition. And People certainly do not get to practice anything that they've learned, right? And practice is very important if you actually want to retain any of the knowledge that you've recently gained. So it's not like you finish the module on encryption and then you're asked to encrypt a bunch of stuff. That never happens. Well, let's, let's assume that's not the problem. Um, the other problem is um, most training is designed for everyone. Right, um, And so Serge Egelman and I.L. Pierre from UC Berkeley actually talked about the myth of the average user. Right, All training is designed for this uh, mythical average user in mind, which may or may not exist. So people have argued for targeted training. The, the problem being that targeted training in most companies actually ends up meaning role-based training, So, which is a perfectly legitimate way and is perfectly reasonable to do, right? So if someone works in human resources, uh, they are going to face a different kind of risk and they're going to have a different kind of access than someone who is a system administrator or someone who is a developer, right? And so, sure, there needs to be different kinds of training for different job roles, but targeted training should needs to go a little bit beyond that, right? So the way um, adults, uh, sorry, sorry, older adults, um, understand cybersecurity risk is going to be different uh, than the way someone who's 18 um, understands cybersecurity risk. And there's a lot of evidence that people do understand risk differently, and so there's an age factor. There's also a gender factor. Uh, men tend to underestimate risk, and women tend to overestimate them. So fun fact, men are six times more likely to drown than women. Uh, and this is mostly because men tend to overestimate how far they can swim. So for the swimmers in the crowd, um, here's a free piece of advice. Uh, you can swim less far than you think you can. If you're male. If you're, if you're male. Um, training evaluation. So let's, so the fact that there's so many problems with the kind of, uh, with the way training is approached uh, well, how can no one's talked about it? Because most companies do not evaluate any training whatsoever. So in academia, you're very, very comfortable with the notion that, you know, if you come up with something, you do a control subject experiment, right? So let's say you come up with a bunch of text to tell people about phishing. Uh, you do a control subject experiment. You have some people read uh, that text. So, uh, you have a control group that does not read that text. And then you have... Uh, both groups classify a bunch of emails into whether they're phishing emails or whether they're legitimate emails, right? These kinds of studies are almost like they're unheard of as an operational practice in security awareness. No one does them. And the handful of companies that do them actually find that there is no difference between trained employees and untrained employees. 
which is not that surprising. So how do they evaluate their training? Well, most e-learning modules have some kind of a test in the end, right? But these tests are very basic. They're designed so people can pass them, right? Because you cannot have complicated tests. If you have complicated tests, people feel like they've been tricked. Uh, organizations uh, conduct employee surveys. And the reason they do them is because when an external auditor comes to audit your security awareness program, uh, you can turn around and say, well, my uh, security awareness program was assessed by this third party vendor. and uh, it actually, here's the metric for it, right? And so corporate executive boards, information risk executive council, a lot of executive in that, um, they conduct biannual surveys. Uh, and a lot of people who use their services, uh, not I mean, I, I'm not going to comment on whether their survey is good or not. But the advantage is because they conduct surveys for so many different companies and their market share is so large, uh, they can give you a comparative statistic uh, as to how's your company doing in the market relative to other companies, not only just overall, but also in your industry peer group. Of course, not all companies have that kind of budget. So some companies just use some kind of an online tool. So SANS has its own employee survey. So some companies will use that. Um, well, most of these surveys, what can you assess with surveys? You can assess knowledge, right? But what you really want to be able to assess is whether training has changed behaviors or not, right? So if I took the e-learning module on passwords, do I now have stronger passwords than I had before? But measuring behaviors or observing behaviors is actually quite expensive because the only way to do that uh, would be to find a random sample of employees who took the password module, a random sample of employees who did not take the password module, uh, go to the root directory, get their passwords, and try and crack them. This will not happen at most companies because this is a huge operational risk. Right? So since um, actually measuring people's behaviors is very hard, uh, there have been some suggestions uh, for so. Again, Serge Egerman and Al Peer, uh, Peel have a scale called the Security Behaviors Intention Scale. And they argue that that scale, uh, even though it can't measure people's behaviors directly, what it can measure is people's intention to behave securely. But this is very new um, and still kind of under investigation. So, there are clearly many challenges with actually training people, right? And the whole concept behind uh, providing facts to uh, employees and end users and non-experts. One, we are not really sure about what are the right facts in security. Even if we had the right facts, some of the training strategies are not necessarily very good. Uh, and certainly, to the extent that they are good, we don't know because evaluations haven't really been conducted in an operational setting. Also, education has a limit in terms of how good it is at changing behaviors. So uh, any smokers in the room? Any ex-smokers in the room? So my parents are both doctors. And I smoked for about six years or so. And uh, I understand what are the risks of smoking very well, heart disease, lung cancer, blah, blah, blah. Um, turns out. Telling smokers all these horrible side effects of smoking actually does very little to change their behavior. In fact, studies have shown that smokers tend to overestimate the risk of smoking, not underestimate it. So that's really not the problem. But again, so education is going to have some impact, but it's this impact is going to be very limited. Um, so if education doesn't really deliver the behavior change that you're looking for, maybe you need to think of something else. So I like this one. Uh, if a child is off task, perhaps the problem is not the child, but the task, right? And you can loosely paraphrase it for security awareness. So if your training does not deliver the, you know, the hopeful security behaviors that you're uh, expecting of your employees, perhaps the employee is not the problem. Your training is the problem. And that's where we get into bribes. 
So I kind of talked about how you know security training can be very dry. It can be you know very um, divorced from context. Um, the other thing is to remember is uh, security is never the primary goal of the employee, right? It's always the thing that actually reduces your productivity, right? So if you are spending all your time checking uh, emails to make sure whether they're suspicious or not, that is time that you're taking away from actually replying to those emails, right? So there has to be some way to kind of offset the cost of security compliance. And that's basically where the bribe part comes in, which is about incentivizing employees to do the right thing. So um, a lot of vendors in the market have talked about gamification, which is basically just you know, run training as competitions between employees, uh, recognize them for completing training, um, recognize their managers, and their because even if you recognize the employee, uh, unless their manager supports them taking time off and actually completing that training, they're not going to do it. Right? Um, then you also have to make that program visible. So you need a little bit of leadership support. And at the very end, uh, track employees who demonstrate good security behaviors and recognize them in some form or the other. And that recognition has to be public so people know uh, that if you do something that is secure and that is good, uh, you're actually going to get rewarded for it. And this is where kind of the marketing aspect comes in. So a few days ago, I saw the Steve Jobs movie uh, that recently came out. I, I, maybe it's old. I don't know anymore. Uh, but it did have this line uh, about Steve Jobs going on and on about how it has to say hello, and by which uh, he meant the Macintosh had to say hello world or something. And the idea there being it has to look friendly, it has to look accessible, it has to be look like something that people want to engage with. And that's where security kind of falls behind in a lot of departments because security is usually seen as something very negative, right? Security is the thing that impedes business. Security is the thing that comes and tells you that you cannot go to website X or you cannot download software Y. Um, so people have talked about, well, hiring marketing people to do security awareness. Uh, SANS, which is one of the big security training providers, uh, probably uh, is, has the biggest market share. Uh, their, uh, one of their directors made the comment that they actually encourage companies to employ marketing people to do security awareness rather than anyone with any kind of technical or security background. Uh, uh, hopefully that was a laugh of derision because that's what I think of it. Um, so his point, uh, his point is not completely wrong. And he basically says that you know, technical people and security people suffer from the curse of knowledge, right? It's kind of what I touched upon earlier, that if you already know what phishing is, it's very hard for you to understand why other people don't get it, right? If you understand how malware works, it's very hard to understand why other people don't get it. On the other hand, if you have a background in marketing and you don't have any background in security, if you yourself don't understand the concept, how in the world are you ever going to explain that concept to someone else? Right? So I think there's, uh, I believe that someone who does security awareness well would have both a technical background, but also have uh, a background in you know, something like psychology, something that is about uh, you know, communicating with uh, non-experts. But I'm biased because I have both of those. So, but there, of course, there, uh, there are other techniques. Uh, there are other things to think about when you're doing security awareness. Uh, so Angela Sass has this whole thing about security usability, so make sure if you want people to follow policies, those policies have to be usable, right? Um, if you want people to use certain security tools, those security tools have to be usable. Experiential learning. So I talked about how people don't really get to actually practice any of the things they've learned. Uh, so uh, there, there are quite a few vendors out in the market who now sell products 
uh, for fishing simulation and social engineering simulation. So I talked about fishing simulations. I'm going to talk about them a little bit more. Uh, psychographic targeting is what uh, Surge group is uh, suggesting. Psychographic targeting is basically uh, because different people make decisions differently, uh, the security awareness materials for them should be constructed differently. So it's very similar to phishing simulations. The, so uh, instead of someone sending out a bunch of random emails, you can call a bunch of people and see if they'll give you their password. And they will. Uh, and credit card information and you know all of that wonderful stuff. They'll even email you company documents if you want them to. It, it's really a question of how convincing you are, right? Um, the whole Kevin Mitnick thing. So I'm going to quickly touch upon the phishing simulation because this market is a little bit mature than the, soci uh, the social engineering simulation market. So for phishing simulation, uh, basically a vendor, you'll hire a vendor uh, who will send out a bunch of uh, fake phishing emails to a bunch of your employees. Um, you'll track how many of your employees clicked on those emails, and that will kind of allow you, uh, you know, once the employee clicks on that, uh, on the embedded link in the email, they're taken to a landing page, and typically that landing page says, hey, this was a training exercise from a company. Uh, you should have checked for X, Y, Z things. Uh, you know, if you don't want to fall for these uh, uh, exercises in the future, go and take a training. Uh, some companies will mandate that training. So if you fall for a phishing simulation, uh, you'll have to take like a 15-minute e-learning module. Uh, the only academic paper that I've been able to find on the efficacy of these simulations as a training tool, and maybe there are others and I just haven't been able to find them, but the only paper I've found is from Deanna Caputo. Uh, and her methodology was at the beginning of the year, she sent out a phishing email. To, uh, to employees in a company, and she tracked which employees clicked on them. Uh, they did some training. Three months later, they sent out another phishing email. Uh, did some training again. Three months later, they sent out another email. And they found that training, the, their method of training had zero impact. So the same 15 people who clicked on the first email were also the same 15 email of people who clicked on the last email. Because I, I assume there was a little bit of uh, you know, margin of error but largely, it's the same group of people who click on that email. So I haven't seen the phishing emails that she sent out, right? So maybe there's some, uh, maybe there's not just enough, you know, you can't prove the null hypothesis that this doesn't work at all, uh, because maybe the emails were just written in a certain way that they only targeted uh, certain job roles in the company, right? So let's be optimistic about it, you know, and there's reason to be optimistic. This is just in time training, training right? So it's great. It's a lot of feedback. Um, so imagine if you could get into some kind of a car simulator where um, after getting drunk and then realize actually you're not great at driving drunk, right? And you get immediate feedback because you keep crashing and then you realize, well, maybe I shouldn't, right? Uh, in, Employees get to practice their skills. So I take an e-learning module, and immediately within the next week, I send out a bunch of phishing emails. So employees get to you know, practice and figure out whether which of these emails are legitimate, which of them are suspicious. Uh, it also allows organizations uh, to assess how good their employees are uh, at being secure. Right. So based on the percentage of employees, who click on these emails, you can say, well, we have like X percent of employees falling for this, so this is kind of a metric for how well our security awareness program is doing. And in fact, companies like Wombat, um, a lot of people will recognize Wombat because it's something that came out of Laurie Trainer's lab at CMU, claim that they can reduce susceptibility um, down by 70%. Here's the problem, though. Uh, Click-through rates are very volatile because it, it really depends on the kind of phishing email you're sending, right? So if I send out an email to everyone in this group saying, uh, hey, uh, I'm a Nigerian prince. I'm sorry for keeping, you know, I don't want to pick on Nigerian princes. I'm sure they're good people. But if I send out an email like that, most of you, hopefully, would ignore that email, 
right? Or if you did open that email, that would be more for laughs and giggles rather than for an actual response. Um, on the other hand, if I, at certain time of the year, if I send out an email, uh, presumably from uh, IEEE S&P, saying that, hey, your submission uh, is not correct. There's some error with the PDF. Can you fix it? Click here. Perhaps a lot more of you would be more likely to fall for it. Right? So the, one of the big problems is that you know, it's very hard to measure the complexity of an email. Uh, unfortunately, it's one of the most common things that is presented to the board. Uh, it's the thing that people discuss all the time. So if two security awareness people meet in a bar, uh, the, the thing that they're going to talk about is the click-through rate. The funny thing is, they both agree that it's completely meaningless. It's kind of like CISSP to a certain degree. A lot of security awareness, like a lot of companies that hire security people say that CISSP doesn't really matter. But at the same time, if you read the job description, it would say CISSP required. Right? So we have all agreed that it doesn't matter, but because that's the only number we have, and more importantly, that's the only number that the board cares about. Right? So if you're going to present the, you know, how well your program is doing to the executive board, they're not going to actually go into the uh, details of what your program looks like. Right? They want something quick that they can grasp. And so inevitably, it's going to be the click-through rate. So there's an incentive for people to send out uh, weaker and weaker phishing emails so their click-through rate keeps going down. The problem with that is employees do not like it when they get weak phishing emails because they feel like they could easily figure that one out. So you are just wasting their time by sending them these emails. That's, of course, not the only problem with phishing simulations. So the question is, how many t times a year should I send out f uh, these phishing emails? Once, twice, thrice? If you do a quick survey of different companies, some companies will fish people once a year. Uh, and they only fish like a small subsection of their employees. Some companies fish every one of their employees once a month. So how, how frequently is good enough? Right. Um, how seriously should you take uh, the click-through rate? Right. How, if if it's meaningless, what information is really is it really giving you? A little bit uh, more on the click-through rate. We don't really know. Uh, well, well, people get. So I've met security awareness professionals who would be like, oh my god, my click-through rate is so high, I need to do something about it. My CISO has been going on and on about how we need to drive down the click-through rate. So of course, ideally, you want 0% of your employees to click on any phishing email that you send out. That's never going to be the case. So the question then becomes, you have to set a low, medium, and high threshold, right? When is it that you should start getting worried about the number of employees clicking on that? Well, critical security controls, which is a security framework originally from SANS, says that low is less than 1%, medium between 1 and 4, high between 5 and 10. They don't even have a word for more than 10% of employees clicking on phishing emails. But actually, more than 10% of employees click on phishing emails all the time. Um, and there was a paper where people tracked how, what percentage of people actually submit their credentials and stuff um, on, uh, on a phishing web page. And the submission rates were between 3 to 45 percent. Presumably, a higher percentage of people actually clicked on the emails to get to the landing page. Uh, JP Morgan Chase um, had a phishing test, I, I want to say, last year. And they noted that they had 20 percent of their employees click on a phishing email and on a simulated phishing email. Verizon says that 23 percent of people click on uh, phishing emails with embedded links and 11% of them download the attachments uh, in a suspicious email. Well, the Canadian government claims that Canada is better and only has a 7% uh, rate. So just to kind of summarize, you know, we've, we've talked about how you know, humans are the weakest link in security. We have a bunch of approaches to kind of train them. Uh, they, they're limited. Uh, 
uh, by definition, and they're certainly limited in the way they're being operationalized in the field right now. Uh, we also don't know how effective they are because our measurement strategies are not very good. Uh, there's not a standard way that different organizations measure uh, their security, right? Uh, relatively speaking, uh, there's a lot of standardization in other risk domains, right, to measure the risk for your organization. Uh, but in, when it comes to the human security control, uh, there's a lot of that standardization is missing. Um, I know I'm um, running close to time. So I want to go back to that original assumption, right? Uh, that humans are the weakest link in security. But why do we assume that? Because every time a ha you know, some organization is breached, uh, the news media reports that you know, employee X and Y clicked on something and then the company got affected and that's what happened and it was the employee's fault. But is that really true? Do companies, is, it, is that the only control that they have in place? Well, that's obviously not true, right? Uh, you have Dave clicking on a link, uh, but then you also have antivirus on Dave's machine. You presumably also have some kind of a host intrusion protection system. You probably also have something on the network. Uh, you presumably have a firewall. So there's a host of other controls that fail, right? Antivirus, which pre uh, I, the statistic that I heard was that uh, most antivirus software only block 70% of malware. But we don't say, well, antivirus doesn't work, we should just not buy it. Right? But, so why do we expect humans to perform 100% of the times, but we don't expect our technical controls to perform 100% of the times? If anything, technical controls should perform better. Right? So, just to close, you know, security awareness is a bit of a market of lemons. Uh, it's not that threats, facts, and bribes don't work, but the way they are being operationalized, uh, they have been limited by how they've been conceived. And also, we don't know to what extent they work because uh, our evaluation strategies are not very good. But there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so there's the International Association of Security Awareness Professionals. This organization started in 2012. Um, Visa is a founding member. Uh, so these folks are kind of working towards having better strategies, having more standardization, um, having uh, a little bit more cohesive body of knowledge that people draw from in order to do security awareness and training. Um, the organization's first coordinator, her name is Pam Salloway. Uh, when I met her, she talked about how we've definitely done good security awareness in the past. And my favorite campaign is the Loose Lips Sink Ships campaign uh, by the Ad Council. Right? Uh, they ran this uh, during the Second World War. It was very effective. Uh, Ad Council has a lot of data on how it was effective. Here's the thing, though. Uh, when they designed the Loose Lips Sink Ships campaign, they didn't just hire the uh, technical person. They didn't just hire the marketing person. They hired a bunch of you know people from different backgrounds because security awareness has a marketing component, it has a behavioral economics component, it has a communications component, and it certainly has a technical component, right? So if you want security awareness to work, you have to hire the right uh, kind of people with the right kind of background, give them the resources, and it will certainly work because it's worked in the past. And people will put up with a People will definitely do security, even if it's an impediment to their job, right? People do this all the time. I mean, the, the interface on a car, if some of you drove in, I drove in today, and it was horrible, right? The, use, the user interface on a car is horrible. We've all kind of come to accept it because we all use it. But uh, if you think about it, tanks don't have the same interface. Have you guys ever seen an, uh, the user interface on a tank? They're not designed like cars. Do you know why? Because there's no time to train everyone who can possibly drive a tank. They're designed so you can just get in a tank and you can just start driving. So there's a better interface out there. We don't use it in cars. We use a poorer interface, right? Be because people are willing to put up with it. And the reason they are willing to put up with it is because they get to drive a car, right? It doesn't sound so big now, but go back 
and X amount of years, when you're a child, you wanted to drive a car. Pretty most people wanted to drive a car, right? So as long as there's like a big, larger goal that pe you can get people to drive towards, right? Which is what they did in Lose Lips Sink Ships campaign. They 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 had a larger message, which was protecting someone, um, United States and uh, the ally, the the forces. Uh, so if you can come up with a bigger message underlying your security awareness program, there's certainly a possibility of creating a more effective program. That's all I have. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them.